Why am I doing this? So that you'll be able to understand exactly what is these so-called uh, innovative building technologies. So I'm going to, 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 to put in, because a number of key players in the industry, and this is your CIDB, your NHBRC, your SABS, the NRCS, and Agrome South Africa. You see that part E, I've said Agrome South Africa, and uh, I'm not pronouncing it correctly. Right? That is a French word, Agrome. Right. So if there's anyone who speaks French, you might be able to correct us correct, uh, uh, correctly. It means approval. Mm -hmm. right. So it's, an, it's, it's a French word, it means approval. Mm -hmm. right. so, but I'm going to tell you about the roles of this and how they get integrated together and how, how these organizations respond to National Building Regulation and Building Standards Act. Then I'll, then start, I'll just highlight a few of the challenges in the national building regulations and the recommendations thereof. Then we zoom into innovation. And again, I come back to Agruma certification, right? And what is the main role there? And what are the products that, that are actually issued by Agruma staff? And then come to some conclusions. All right. But uh, I'm not too sure uh, 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 um, the, from the project uh, uh, director. Uh, whether I want people to stop me as I proceed or I can continue until I finish off. Um, you, you, you'll go ahead. If, if I see that there is something that we need clarity on, I'll, I'll definitely jump on, if that's All fine right. with you. All right, no, that's fine with me, cool. Thanks. Okay, colleagues, let me get uh, uh, into context, international perspective, right? And internationally, everyone uses what's called the building code or a building regulation, right? And what is a building code? What is a building regulation? This is a set of a document which is used by your local government or your national or provincial government to actually control the building practice. So it is a document which has got a set of statements, functional statements. And the very key word is that it is a document which, which is a set of functional statements of acceptable minimum requirements of building performance, right? So a building code or a building regulation is in most countries, it is a law, it is a legal document. But in most cases, this building code regulation does not tell you how to do something it tells you the minimum requirements of performance of a building, mm -hmm. right? So it can be able to tell you then that uh, in the event that there is a fire, people should be able to evacuate the building within the next 30 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. right? So it gives you the performance requirements, the minimum, as I said, you must be able to evacuate within 30 minutes. Does not mean then that your building, people cannot evacuate in three hours. Or whatever. Right? So if people can be able to, 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 to say, this is the minimum performance requirements that I am giving you, right? that is the law. Right? If I say then that uh, uh, the minimum requirements is that room to room, this is the acoustics levels that I require. That is the minimum performance levels. You can exceed the minimum performance requirements, but that is a law. Right? So this is a building code with a building regulation. On the other hand, a building standard, a building standard, these are documents which would set out some activity that are related to the building or the construction. It's a technical document, they standardize. Now this gives you procedures, right? On how to actually meet a certain performance requirement. So we should be able to, to differentiate clearly what is the law and what is the standard. A standard, I'm giving you a procedure, right? And, and this is a set of activities right, that you need to be able to confirm with in order for you to meet certain performance requirements. All right. So there are many types of, 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 of standards that are available. Right. And, and, and I'm specifically talking to building and construction, but remember that standards could be 
for any other product or material, and they could typically cover your product and design, could cover workmanship or quality control. They can also go through the whole life cycle of a building. So from your product and design through into construction workmanship, all the way to demolition and recycling, you can have standards that cover all these things. Now, internationally, uh, there is a, an agreed sort of, uh, uh, it's a four or a five level regulatory environment system. We started off in Norway, which is it's usually called the five level uh, 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 regulatory system, right? And, and you can break it down. Some people go four levels or five levels, right? Mm -hmm. So the regulatory environment is structured in this fashion, which is what I've shown here. Usually any regulatory environment has got what is called the level one. The level one gives you the goal, the objective of what you want to be able to achieve. Right? And, and, and I'm going to specifically maybe talk a, 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 a about, let's say a house. And if I'm going to talk about a house, my goal might be, I want a house that, that a, a, a provides housing consumers uh, with homes which are free from structural defects. That is the goal. Very high level, but I've not, if you were to ask me, I've just said, I want to provide housing consumers with a house which is free from structural defects. Right? I have not specified what needs to happen. What, 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 what are the functional specifications? Right? So level two then give, gives you the detailed functional requirements right? of what exactly is your expectation. And I said the functional requirements is that this building must be able right, to withstand a certain requirements of a certain given loading. Level three then get, gives you into the details of the, what is the exact performance requirements, right? So the performance requirements now, this is now to give you quantitatively, right? What is to be achieved for each of the functional requirements. So it, it sort of now quantifies that and gives you in a quantitative manner what is actually required, required or functional requirements, right? Now, having been given the performance requirements, now the question is now, how do I satisfy these performance requirements? So if I have given you quantitatively then that, you know what, this wall, if I have a wind, which is a, 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 a five kilopascals, right? This wall must not fall down. I have quantified it. I've given you the performance requirements then that this wall must be able to withstand a wind of five kPa. It's a performance requirement. Now then you are now then saying, oh, okay, how do I satisfy this? How do I know that this wall is capable of withstanding this amount of wind load? Then it goes to level four, level four. How do you satisfy that? There are four ways, in fact, we can combine them to three ways of satisfying this performance requirement. One is what is called the deemed to comply code provisions, deemed to comply, deemed to satisfy. These are rules which if you follow these rules, you are deemed to comply the performance requirement. So if I say to you, ah, you know what, you are talking about this wind for this particular wall. If I give you certain rules and I say, you know what, one of the rules is build a wall which is 140 millimeters thick. Don't do anything else. I'm just giving you a rule, 140 millimeters thick. If you go and build this wall, which is 140 millimeters thick, you are deemed to satisfy this performance requirements which means you are deemed to comply the functional requirements, meaning you are deemed to comply with the law, the national building regulations, by utilizing deemed to satisfy rules. The second alternative way, so I've 
and you see a 140 millimeter wall. The second way is then by what is called by testing or by calculation. Right? Because I might then decide that I do not want to use a 140 millimeter wall. Then we say to you, oh, if you don't want to use 140 millimeter wall, please go ahead. What do you want to use? You say, I want to use an 80 millimeter wall. We then say, ah, oh, if you want to do so, the deem to satisfy rule, you want to deviate from that, then either by calculation or by testing, demonstrate to us then that your deviation of 80 millimeter wall will meet this performance requirement and therefore meet the law. So you're deviating, right? So this is what is normally referred to by people a, a, a calling them rational design or rational assessment, right? You are deemed to, the, you, you are not following the deemed to comply. You are saying, start the 140 millimeter wall. I want to use my own, uh, my own 80 millimeter wall. Then the third uh, way or the fourth way, right, that you can do that is by either what is called the combined testing and, and, and calculation and certification. And that is what I'm going to come up to later on and describe to you what that entails. But this is how the regulatory environment is structured internationally. But I'm going to zoom in and say, this is in, in Norway, in the UK, you know, they all follow this structure in coming up with the regulation, the regulatory environment. Then I want to zoom into that, uh, into this framework and show you how the South African one is actually mirrored through this process and how innovation is mirrored into the regulations. So the South African regulatory environment there are a number of apps which govern uh, the regulatory environment. And I'm talking specifically here about housing. So you've got the National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act. You've got the Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act, which, which establishes NHPRC, Occupational Health and Safety, the CIDB Act, the Consumer Protection Act, the National Regulator for Composal Specifications Act. And you've got many other acts, right? which you may use on your daily basis, your management of housing development, the rental and sales of homes provision by the state of housing. There are many, many acts, right? But the ones that are critical in our discussion today is the National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act, the Cons Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act. And these are the acts that, and, the, and, and see the integration with the National Regulator for Composite Specifications. This is what I would want to sort of like integrate and see how it works. So, the, Organizations that respond to these acts, which organizations respond to these acts, right? So to do that, there's the CIDB. The CIDB responds to the CIDB Act. The National Home Builders Registration Council, right? It responds to the Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act. The South African Bureau of Standards, right? It responds to the Standards Act. The National Regulator of Composite Specifications, NRCS, also responds to, to, uh, uh, to some of the composite specifications and agreements traffic. I want to then zoom in and then highlight to you then how these organizations actually operate within the regulatory environment. So the white paper on, on, on construction, which was started off in 1999, the white paper uh, driven by the Department of Public Works, it made a provision for creating an enabling environment for what is popularly known as the OR GPO, your reconstruction, growth, and development in the construction industry. So this white paper, right, which was established in 1999, it spelled out exactly the government policy initiative. And government policy initiative 1999 was to say, we want a vehicle, we want a mechanism in which we enhance delivery. We want to have greater stability we want to have a better performance of our construction industry. We want to have good value for money when we invest in the construction industry. Right? And it is this that then led on to the establishment of the Construction Industry Development, Act, Development Board. So the Construction Industry Development Board was established through the White Paper of 1999. Right? And what when they established it, then what was the role of CIDB? 
So CITB, it's a regulatory body, right? The regulatory body that ensures that con the construction industry, it develops, right? And it is competitive locally and internationally. We want to ensure then that our construction industry is relevant, right? Our construction industry, it contributes to the social and economic growth of the country. So the focus of the CIDB is sustainable growth. It's about developing the capacity and the capability of the industry. It's about empowering the industry. It's about improving the performance of the industry and putting up best practices. Most importantly, transforming the industry, right? Ensuring that there are ethical procurement practices and good enhanced value for money to our clients and society. So that was the purpose of the CIDB, broadly looking at the broader construction industry. All contractors, according to the CIDB Act, all contractors, as well as all construction projects in the public space must be registered with the CIDB so that they are able to do all these things that we've highlighted here. So if you are working in this public space, your project has to be registered and the contractor must be registered with the CIDB. Right? And that is only applicable. Yes, it does not exclude the private sector, but for the public sector, that is actually a must. Then here comes then the organization called NSBRC, which was established in 1999 as well, right? through an act of parliament. Right? So there is the Housing Consumer Protection Measures Act, which was promulgated in 1999, and that act made, made provision for establishment of an organization called NHBRC. This organization was now to say, hey, we see poor quality houses being built in the Republic of South Africa. We see fly-by-night contractors in this industry. Let's establish this organization and let's give it a mandate to regulate this industry to also establish and promote technical and ethical standards in the industry. And most importantly, we want improved structural quality for the housing consumers and the home building industry. So it is a specific mandate, right? To zoom into the home building industry, right? So in this, in this, within this NHBRC, right? The minister provides for technical requirements that a home builder must satisfy. And these technical requirements are related to structural strength and stability, serviceability, how does a home respond in fire, drainage, and stormwater management. These requirements are prescribed by the minister. Then the third important one is the SABS. The SABS has got a different role to the entities that I've mentioned so far. So the SABS role, right, this is also a body which was established through, again, an act of parliament, the Standards Act, Act 24, 1945. This responsibility of this body called SABS is to promote and maintain standardization and quality of commodities and services. Right? It does not specifically talk about construction industry only, but talks about standardization and quality of commodities and services. For your information, right, SABS up until 2007, SABS was a ref and a player. Right? It was a ref and a player in the sense that it was developing standards, but at the same time, it was also monitoring the standards. Right? And that becomes now a ref and a player. So 2007, SABS had to split the organization into two. The one that is responsible for certifying, the one that is responsible for developing up the standards. And I will talk a little bit more about that. So that's your, that's your SABS. SABS is there to write. What are their objectives? They must, SABS must publish. They write and publish national standards. They put committees there. Right? These committees here, they put, they put representatives from industry and et cetera. Right? They test and only certify products and, set, and services, right? promote design excellence, and they provide training aspects of standardization. But there's one thing that was removed from SABS. Right? The one thing was the ref player, the, the, ref, uh, the ref and player issue, which I mentioned, which was then split from this SABS. And that is what one thing which I want to talk about. So 
SABS, they write these standards, and these standards are called SANS or SANS. The SANS, what is written by this by the SABS, they write those standards which I have spoken about. They tell you that this is a recipe. So these are like your chefs. This is the chef. The chef gives you a recipe. You follow the chef's recipe, you are able to come up with a nice piece of carrot cake. Right? So the SABS, they write recipes. Right? You follow the recipe, you are actually following the what is called then the deemed to comply rules. <laughs> so the purpose of SABS is to write recipes deemed to comply rules for the functional requirements. That is their purpose. Right? You follow them. You follow their methodology, right? You are deemed to comply. That is what SABS does. Right? You don't want to make a 100, 140 millimeter thick wall, go elsewhere. You want to use a 140 millimeter wall, use the recipe as described by South African National Standards. So when they do these standards uh, development, there are many people involved, as I mentioned. They are the owners, the, the practitioners and academics, all are involved in developing these standards. But let me tell you, there's usually a war because you've got practitioners. Practitioners, they want some simple things quick to use. Academics, they want more complex things, very things that are typically very correct. You've got the developers on the other hand, developers, they want anything. They don't want anything that, that, that they would end up paying a lot of money. So there are all these tensions that happen. But at the end of the day, they develop a standard on behalf of SABS and SABS becomes the custodian of a recipe book. Hmm? Then the fourth organization is Agrome in South Africa. Agrome in South Africa, as I mentioned to you, that this is a French word. Uh, this is also a statutory body, but this body promotes innovation and technology in the construction industry. The purpose of this organization is to provide fee assurance. They provide assurance for fit for purpose of construction products. They then say, okay, so if a material does not comply with South African national standards, now I bring in a material, a material that you have never known before. A material that I've, so I'm dealing with polystyrene and I don't know the behavior of this material called polystyrene. Right? SABS cannot write a recipe book around that. They don't know. Right? Then that now goes into the domain of Agroma South Africa, which then says, okay, you are now giving us a new product. When we look at this new product here, we must ascertain and make sure that this new product, it actually complies with the law, the National Building Regulations. Right? And what do they do? I'll talk about it also in detail. So there are these other organizations, which are then called your Agroma South Africa, your CSIR and SABS. How are they related? How are they related? You know the CSIR. CSIR is a science council. They are there to develop new concepts. Right? So the role of CSIR is to develop new concepts. Right? They don't certify anything. They develop, they are researchers, they develop concepts, technology development. Once that technology has been developed, it's then gets passed on to Agroma South Africa. Agroma South Africa then verifies then that this product that you, this, you are talking about, it meets the law. They do the relevant tests to ensure that this new product meets the law. Once this product has been used, it can be used for one year, two years, 10 years, 20 years. The industry becomes now comfortable with this new product. When they become comfortable with the new product, who then takes over? SABS then takes over and they say, ah, we see this new material. We've seen it for the last 10 years. Can't we now write a recipe book around this product? They then write a recipe book on that. It becomes now a deemed to comply rule. So a product starts from nowhere. Organizations such as CSIR and other research institutions, they develop the concept. It gets tested by Agroma. During that phase of testing by Agroma, it, Agroma makes sure that it complies with the law. It gets implemented on the ground. 
People then start to get happy with that. So I don't know if you've encountered a product such as lightweight steel. Lightweight steel many years ago, right? it was under Agroma certification. But you now go through, there's now a standard called SANS 517 for lightweight steel. Where is it done now? It is migrated from being an Agroma certified product to a deemed to comply product. We can now use lightweight steel because it is a deemed to satisfy product. There's now a recipe for lightweight steel. All right. Then the fifth one, which is now the, the national regulator for compulsory standards or specifications. Right? NRCS, this is an organization which resides in the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Right? It administers technical regulations. Right? So NRCS is not only responsible for the construction industry, but it's involved in automotive, electrotechnical and gaming, chemical, mechanical, food industry. But for our interests in the construction industry, it is the one that is responsible for administering the National Building Regulations and Building Standards Act. Right? So this is the splinter organization from SABS. So in 2007, this was the one which was the player. It was then removed from SABS and started off as a national regulator for composite space. So it is now the one an entity on its own, which then administers the law. So with SABS, SABS law, right standards. This one is responsible for writing the law right? and administering this law. All your building control inspectors, they report away through this law. Right. So we need to understand a little bit more about the law because you don't comply with the law, you go to jail. You don't comply with an SABS standard, you don't go to jail. Right. It's just a recipe book. Right. But if the recipe book is quoted in the law, that recipe becomes also a law. Right. So what does this law say? all new building works in South Africa, all of them, new building works, they must comply with this law, the National Building Regulations. It gives you the minimum standards in terms of safe, safety, health, structural stability. All municipalities are obliged to ensure that, that no building is constructed without ensuring that the design and the joints, they conform to the law. So with that now, we now go back to our, to, our, to, to our four level structure and then say, how is South Africa therefore structured? So our level one, which is then the objective, the objective in terms of South Africa, our objective is the constitution, the constitution act and the national building regulation. So the constitution, right? It tells you something. Everyone has got a right to a, to, to a decent living, right? It's the constitution. Gives you broad statements of intent, societal expectations of what the building is supposed to be. So your constitution then talks to your national building regulations. Right? So the constitution says everyone has got a right to a decent living. Then the national building regulations then say, ah, that house, that, you, that decent living you are talking about, make sure that the house is safe to live in. National building regulations, right? So it gives you then the requirements, right? It must be safe to live in national building regulation. Then the performance description, the functional requirements now, it then also goes in the, in the national building regulation, that's why it's called national building regulation, building standards act. It then tells you qualitatively, right? The terms that what is actually required in terms of the method of construction, the techniques, and the dimensions. So it gives you then the functional regulations are also then stipulated in the national building regulations. But the build, national building regulations do not give you the performance parameters. What is actually required for the building not to fall down? It doesn't do so. But what the national building regulations, listen to this, carefully what the national building regulations do. They refer you to a certain standard, which is called SANS 10400. It says to you, performance parameters, 
hey, please go and get these performance parameters in SANS 10400. I remember I said to you, SANS is not, is not a law. But because SANS has been referred to by national building regulations, it means now SANS 10400 is also a law. Right? So the performance parameters now are stipulated in SANS 10400. It specifies to you now, it gives you exactly what needs to do to happen with a building. Then the, because now SANS 10400 is a law, 10400 now tells you how to comply with the law. 10400 says, how do you comply with the law? So 10400 then says, you comply with the law if you follow the recipe. It also says, you follow the recipe. But then what does 10400 do? It also gives you the recipe as well, right? So you follow 10400 recipe. Hey guys, you have no problems at all, right? Because you are there for complying with 10400, you are meeting the national building regulations, you are meeting the constitutional needs. But then this 10400 realizes, ah guys, we also allow you to do a rational design or rational assessment. It means that a competent person, a competent person could be a competent engineer or an architect. Then that competent person develops a rational. So if you don't want to go for the 140 millimeter wall, 10400 says, oh, you don't want to follow me. It's fine. Make sure your competent person produces a rational design or a rational assessment. In this 10400, then says, ah, but hey, guys, if we are stuck to this recipe, and these rational designs by this competent person will be stuck in 1600, right? So the 10400 then says, ah, I'll give you another alternative way. If you come up with a material of your own, right? come up with a material of your own, I allow you to do so, right? But please, before you use that material of your own, go through Agroma certification. Right? Because now you are bringing a new material. We don't know the behavior of this material. If I put it in fire, a brick or a clay brick, I know what it does when I put it in fire. You are now telling me about polystyrene. I don't know what it does under fire. I don't know how it does in terms of its thermal performance and energy performance. Please go to this organization called Agroma South Africa. Right? And Agroma South Africa will do all the relevant tests if Agroma gives you a certificate, it means, therefore, you are complying with SANS 10400, meaning you are complying with national building regulations. So theoretically, you have got three ways in which you can actually comply with the law. Either use the recipe book, the SANS 10400, formulas given in SANS 10400, requirements, just follow it, 10400, you are okay. Build your house, build your building, and follow the recipe book. You are okay. Nobody will bother you. And this is the method that most people use. That's why they don't have problems with the city council, etc., because they are just following the recipe book. Or alternatively, they say, go to your competent person, go to your engineer or architect. He must or she must produce a rational design. I don't have a problem with that. Then that produces a rational design. City council also does that. But if you're coming up with a new product, right? go and have an Agroma certificate, right? And what is that? This is what is then uh, called, which is what you guys are referring to as alternative building technologies, right? So others are actually saying, is, is it alternative in terms of alternative to the co to comply rules or uh, rational design? Is that what is called then you know, uh, 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 alternative? But you can have a mixture. You can have a mixture of I'm going to use deemed to comply with rules, rational design, as well as agroma certification. I look at a typical house. In a typical house, I might use conventional foundation, which is deemed to comply with rules, or I can use a foundation where I require an engineer to, 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 to design a specific type of a foundation, right? So the foundation is either deemed to satisfy or it's a rational design. My walling systems, my walling systems, I'm going to use an agroma certificate, right? And I'm going to use lightweight steel as my structure, right? With some cladding, which is actually certified by agroma. So the lightweight steel, I'm using the deemed to comply rules. So I'm having a mixture of everything into one particular design. 
right? So we normally then say, or people are saying alternative, but I know we do it. We, we have wrapped out the way the alternative is said, alternative to what? Innovative, other people still, still comfortable with innovative because now you're coming up with an innovative solution to what you're actually looking at, right? But we are only saying, saying that you are actually using the non-conventional building products in conjunction with the conventional. Conventional meaning you are using the team to satisfy requirements. Right? So this is how 10400, I'm not going to go through 10400, looks like. If you've never seen 10400, you can never have it on your desk because it's very thick, part A to part X, and now there's XA and XB, so with A, B, C, D all the way up to X, and they were running out of numbers and went through to X, A, X, B, etc. And each part has got the certain things that you actually have to comply. So if I am going to do a, 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 a anything that is related to drainage, right, I will go to part P, and part P will keep tell me the rules, the recipe around drainage. I want glazing, I go to part N, it tells me the rules, the recipe book, around glazing, right? But there's no recipe in this SANS 10400 with regards to innovative building technologies. So where do I get the recipe, right? For innovative building technologies, I must go to Agroma. And how do I ensure then that I'm actually utilizing the correct products, right? So <clears throat> on this slide here, I, and, and I will not go through this one in detail, but for each of the stages of construction, here are your different bodies. So if you are still doing your project development, you are conceptualizing, you are going through design, who are the regulators, right? So you can now see the integration of the different, the different role players at each of the stages of, 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 of your delivery of your building. So when you are still doing your, your, conceptual, your conceptualization, this is where your professional bodies come into play. When you are into project uh, documentation and procurement, this is where the national regulator of compulsory specifications come. And when you are during construction, this is where the CIG, the NSBRCs, et cetera, and they all come into play. Mm -hmm. right. So many challenges with regards to uh, building regulations, right? And uh, 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 the problems with building regulations, colleagues, is then that the processes are too much delineated. They reside in different government departments. And that's why it's so difficult for you to actually implement these national building regulations uh, correctly, right? It's also very difficult to apply some of these national building regulations, particularly in housing, with respect to your energy efficiencies and all these subsidy quantums that are provided. So now going to in, in, give you now the context. Let's get into the zoom into innovation within the construction industry, specifically within the home building industry. All right, we know the challenges in construction, right? The brick and mortar is a proven, it's proven, right? So it's a proven material that, uh, that we can use, right? We know the issues around the energy efficiency. We know the issues around the indoor uh, environmental quality, right? Issues around light and acoustics, etc. We know then that this product, it behaves very well. It's the question is how do you put it together? How do I assemble my materials together so that I get a better product, right? There are also issues related to things like your logistics, particularly when I'm dealing with rural areas. Right? How do I get my bricks to, in, 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 to the rural areas? How do I make provisions for, uh, uh, for toilets right? and your, your other waste connections? The quality of the final products and the input materials usually not acceptable. So when you get a failure with the conventional, it's either one of the three or a combination of these three is either your design, your workmanship, right, or your materials. One of those three is actually not right. right? But we know, and, and the question is, how do we then deal with these, uh, uh, with these uh, 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 problems, right? There's also an issue around compliance to the standards, right? I mentioned in the standards that part XA and XB uh, XB is almost, they are almost finishing and there's a revision of part XA, if I'm not mistaken now, right? How are we going to ensure then that the buildings, the houses that we are going to build, they comply with the new regulations? With the new regulations, you would require 
to have actually solar water heating systems, right? You require to have things like your ceilings and your roof insulations. And these are all things that are going to add on not less than 30,000 on top of what you are actually currently spending, particularly when you look at low income houses. So we're going to look, look into this all expensive. So when we look at all the problems, and I'm sure that you, uh, in your previous discussions last year or so, you have talked about this alternative of innovative, unconventional building technologies, right? We are looking at moving from manufacturing high quality houses, right? We want to be able to manufacture quality houses. We want to be able to see designs that would address your environment, your climatic conditions, different architectural typologies. We don't want to see the same design throughout. And the reason why we normally have these box meshed houses is because the brick and mortar, that's what it can do with cost effectiveness. Right? But we need to be able to see how can we fast track the delivery of social infrastructure as well as housing. Yes. Considering that the housing backlog at the moment is sitting at more than 2.5 million, how should we try a, a, a traject into the future? And that is where we are actually talking about putting in innovative building technologies. Right? We want to be able to start looking at the technological innovations, right? Move from the brick and mortar. Let's look into modular construction, prefabricated modular construction. And in China and, and other countries, they are able to actually put up many of these structures within a short time period. During the COVID period, I'm so sure that you saw a lot of these uh, 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 videos, which were showing social infrastructure being delivered in China within a short time period. So clinics were being put up within a few days. And that is modular construction, prefabricated modular construction, and that is where we would want to actually go through. To. So the many, many, many materials are used in terms of modular construction. You've got your concrete, your steel, your treated timber, aluminium, lightweight concrete. And when I talk about lightweight concrete, right, there's this issue of called AAC, autoclaved aerated concrete. Colleagues, this is a very good material, very light. I'm talking here in the order of about 600 plus minus kilograms per cubic meter. No more concrete weighs about 2,400. And autoclaved aerated concrete is about 600 plus minus, right? Which means it's about 25% of your normal concrete. What savings can you do when you are dealing with the multi-story buildings, right? You start to save on the structure, you start to save on the cost of your foundation. Right? So there are many of these types of prefabricated and modular constructions that one needs to look into. Right? What are the good things around this prefabricated uh, uh, construction? The practice is in that you can assemble them, you can manufacture them under a proper controlled environment. Right? And the, a number of these things here have been used for developments including your apartments, your housing developments, et cetera. So you have got good control in terms of what you can produce. So you are producing a car in a controlled environment. You are producing a BMW in a controlled environment, right? So instead of you producing everything on site, everything is done under a controlled environment in the manufacturing, right? And there are a number of, of, of advantages of doing things, things here under controlled environment. Most importantly, we can also try and utilize local available raw materials, which would ultimately reduce, have a reduction in carbon footprint, cost effectiveness. But what I would want to underline here is social acceptability and bankability of these good products. Particularly if we're talking about prefabricated and modular construction. Right? Colleagues, there are many types of building products, innovative products that are out there in the market. But in terms of social acceptability, there's a challenge. Why is there a challenge? Because people are used to brick and mortar. They do not want that knock on effect. Right? They would want to really hear then that this product sounds good and strong. Right? And how do we actually ensure that that is actually happening? How do we ensure that the social acceptability? How do we ensure then that the banks, right? Uh, would accept these products here. Right? So as long as we have then the Agroma certification, Agroma certification would enable me to ensure then that 
This product has met all the local requirements. And I will then talk about that, right? So there are a lot of perceptions, obviously, about prefab construction. People will tell you that the quality of the materials is substandard. They will tell you that the durability of the materials is short term, that the materials are not available locally. I cannot maintain the house post-construction, that the cost of producing this is high. It's difficult for remodeling if I want to add and, and or alter, and if I want to reduce labor force during construction and implementation. So these are some of the, these are perceptions. But when you talk about quality, durability, availability, maintenance, and cost effectiveness, they, right, this is where I would want to bring in Agoma to be able to answer some of these specific questions. So what we need to start thinking, we now start need to rethink the designs to address perceptions. We need to come and formulate new designs that would address these perceptions. We need to have mindsets, and this mindset starts, starts from you guys around the table, young minds, which can create a shift. We need to shift our mindsets from mass produce, producing houses to mass customization. Mass customization meaning then that I must be able to customize my, the needs of my clients, not to mass produce every single house that looks exactly the same, but let's look into mass customization of buildings. We must be able to embrace parametric modeling for site-specific issues. So look at value-driven responses right, for a specific customer. Right? So we need to start rethinking this stuff. But we also need to look into some of the socioeconomic things that we need to, uh, to look at. The shortage of skilled la trade labor in communities. So people are used to the brick and mortar. By looking at modular construction, it does not mean then that you are losing labor. You are only shift, you may be shifting labor from one position to the other position. You might be reducing labor on site, but you're increasing labor in the factory. So you are not necessarily reducing your labor force in the market, but you might be transferring labor force from one area to the other area. But at the same time, I'm also looking at the improved construction quality. Imagine something that is being manufactured in a factory. If I say I want this block to be two meters to the dot, I will make sure then that I get it two, me two meters plus or minus one millimeter. Right? Whereas if I do it on site, I cannot guarantee that I'll get two meters. I may mean, end up with 1.95 meters or so. Right? So there are these things that we need to look into. Improvement in terms of construction product, productivity under, under the, uh, 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 the factory environment, the productivity is going to increase, reduction in the lead time to, to deliver. And I can have also sustainable solutions, sustainable designs that can take me 30 years plus. Then there are many other benefits that are, uh, one should be able to look in terms of uh, prefab construction, right? As I mentioned, the components are manufactured by industrial methods. Right. There's, there's unlimited opportunities for architects. Architects can come up with the various types of typologies. So you are not longer looking at these box houses. Right? So you have good modular construction, low maintenance, better predictability, uh, uh, issues around, around plumbing and electrical, they're easy to actually implement during the manufacturing process. Right? So the, from an economy point of view, you can have with some of these innovative technologies reduction in waste of materials, your low water consumption, because with some uh, uh, technologies, there's not even a need to look into water issues. Right? Possibilities of increased wake, uh, wake us, uh, safety issues, good sound insulation, thermal insulations, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But as I've mentioned, there are also setbacks, which we agree to, that there are setbacks in terms of prefabrication. Heavy members. You might need cranes in some, in some instances. There might be problems with connections. There might be problems with economics. Uh, workmanship might also be a problem on certain other sites. So again, you need to be able to take all these other things into, into account, right? And the one thing that, one, that you might have to look into is you need to look into supply and demand issues. What, what are the challenges on the, in, on the real ground? Number one, on the supply side, we've got very few manufacturers in South Africa. Whereas on the demand side, we, we are actually targeting the low income consumers, whereas we are supposed to be targeting everyone within the value chain of housing delivery. 
yeah. on the supply side, there are challenges, stigma issues, volume issues, perce perceptions in terms of designs, financial is a, a problem, a resistance to change, right? And on the demand side, you also have similar, similar, similar issues. But there are many opportunities, colleagues. There are opportunities to create innovation, innovative products, quality and sustainable products, lower cost and higher qualities, etc. Yeah. But what I need you to, 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 to conclude with is actually agroma certification. Because now this is now zooming specifically into the, the agroma. I said, then said uh, uh, there are perceptions, and those perceptions they need to be dealt with. Right? What does Agroma look into when you have a new product? Agroma looks into all these things here highlighted. They look into structural strength and stability. They look at the performance in fire. They look at water penetration. They look at thermal and energy performance, condensation problems, acoustics problems, accuracy of the building, durability issues, quality management issues. And lastly, they make recommendation, does this product comply with national building regulation? So if you get in a product which has been certified by Agroma, it means that that product is meeting the law. That product is complying with national building regulation. They have already looked into all these things here. So you cannot ask me that is this product, is it durable? If it is an Agroma certificate, it has been looked into. Right? Am I going to have problems with fire? It has been looked into. All these things here have been wow. specifically looked into. Right? So Agroma has gone through a hell lot of different types of tests of what is, uh, it's comprehensive, right? When you are actually looking into that. So what is an Agroma certificate? Guys, I need to tell you, the certificate is not a one pager. Agroma certificate is a book. It's also a recipe book. So this agroma certificate, it will contain details of how the structure is manufactured, details of how the product is going to be assembled on site. There are going to be drawings in it, right? There are going to be restrictions in it. If there are certain uh, things that this product cannot do, they are all highlighted in it. Its performance with, in fire, all that information is contained in this certificate. So this certificate colleagues, is not a one pager, it is a recipe book for performance of the building in terms of complying with the, with the law. Right? So it provides you all this descriptive information in terms of that. Yep. So, what does it provide? So, so what does it provide? It does, when you look at a certificate, for example, this certificate here, it would give you a certificate number, it would give you validity, its uses, its limitations, applicable conditions, the licensees, right, and I'll talk a little bit about licenses and all the compliances with the, with, with the NHPRC, they are all highlighted. Dr. Mahachi. Yes? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I think um, we, uh, on that point that you are still making, you are making um, a, a valuable points. And uh, one of our guests has actually asked a question, which I think it's in line with what you are trying to explain now. I just mm -hmm. wanna push in the question so that you, while you explain what you are taking us through, you can also, have it in mind. So Karen Storm is asking, do we know what the timelines of agreement certification is? Do we know what what what, what is the time frame? Okay. So uh, the certification uh, yes that you are dealing yeah, with now. Yeah, thanks for that question. You see, uh, uh, there's one information which I was also just trying to hide. Eh? And, okay. and 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 um, uh, one of the things that I can also tell you, and I'm telling you uh, in confidence, because yes. uh, I'm the chairperson of Agro. Okay. <laughs> Fine. So the answers you are getting are getting it straight from the chairperson of Agro. <laughs> 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 All, right. All right. All right. Uh, uh, time, time, time limits. It actually depends. Uh, I, I go back to this specific slide, which which I was saying. This is what Agro tests. It looks into structural strength, performance in fire, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So, if you come up with a new product and you have not done any of these things here, it will take you up to two years. Huh? But if you have done some, some people bring their products from Europe or from China or from Brazil, and they have done some of these tests. Right? If they have been done by an accredited body, and let's say it is fire. Then, in that case, Agroma does not repeat the fire test. Right? 
And if they recognize that, that fire and say, ah, okay, fire has been done, but they've not done uh, acoustics. Let's redo acoustics. If they're not happy with the fire test, then they'll say, we are going to redo the fire test. But one of the things that takes the time period to as much as two years of all these tests that are indicated here is actually performance in relation to fire. In South Africa, unfortunately, there's only one fire left. The whole of South Africa has got one fire left. Right? So, you, so you can imagine if, if, if there are 10, uh, 10 people who would want to have, and each fire test can take anything between a, a, a close to a month to do a fire test. So if you are if you are if you are in queue number ten, right, and there's only that one fire lab test, you are already into one year. Right? So so if you are bringing up a technology and that technology has not been done fire test, you are most likely going to be in the period one year to two years. Right? But otherwise, if 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 all the tests you have done the test. And I also recommend you go to other academic institutions. Other academic institutions, they can do some of these tests for you. Particularly your structural strength and stability. For instance, I know Taki's University of Pretoria, Professor Busik, is very good. He, he has done a lot of these uh, structural strength and stability tests. Things. He does them within the next two, three weeks, he can do it for you. Resistance to water penetration, thermal, et cetera, condensation, acoustics. So if you, if you do those things yourself, and then you take the, uh, the test reports to Agrom. You say, I already have Professor Butsi who has done this structural test, right? Then in that case, it will not take you long. So can I come in there? Because you, you are also touching on a point that uh, one of our guests would like to, uh, to, to, to follow up on. So mm -hmm. with, with the bodies that actually do the tests, would, would Agrom accept tests from international bodies? Yes. It does, accept, but you see, uh, 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 it has to be within within that uh, uh, body. Uh, the uh, uh, it, mu it must have been an accredited institution, mm -hmm. right, within the country. Right? Yeah. Then remember, Agroma South Africa. Right? There are many other countries with also equivalents of Agroma around the world. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and they, are, they are members of what is called WAFTA, or W F T A O, World Federation Association of, of, of Technical Organizations, WAFTA. Yes. Right? If, if your product has been certified right, by a WAFTA member, Agroma will automatically recognize that. But then he remembered because if, if you are going to bring a, a, a product which has been certified in Europe with a terrible weather conditions, weather conditions in South Africa are not the same. So we might need to do one or two tests which are not the same as in Norway mm -hmm. and to do them locally. Right? But a structural test, for example, if a structural test is done in Norway, it will be the same structural test that you do here. So there's no problem here. But your thermal, your, your thermal performance, your energy performance will probably be different. And therefore, your test that will do will be limited. <laughs> All right. No, thank you very much for that. Um, can I also just take time? So uh, what I'm going to do now is to try and cover some of the questions that have been asked by our guests and also to cover some of the questions that we have uh, prepared to have a discussion with you about. But before I jump onto that, can I just acknowledge uh, Mr. Rale Mampeule, who has also joined us. Thank you very much. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Rale and Mackenzie Mampeule Foundation. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so we'll we'll just kick start with the with with the discussion that we we, we just want you, uh, Dr. Mahaji, to take us through. And Mr. Mampeule, at any time you can just also come in if if something interests you. Would like to also get your perspective on some of the things that are being discussed. Uh, understanding that you are also very much uh, you know um, knowledgeable about this these matters. So. Dr. Mahachi, are you happy to start with um, just the questions that we're getting from our guests? Yes, it's quite right. And yeah. welcome, uh, Mr. Rally. Yeah. Yes. So you 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 spoke very very much about uh, you know the, the the laws that uh, you know needs to be followed, everything needing to be approved, the tests needing to be done, and 
understanding that this is a new, uh, the pretty much new technology that we are we, we, we are embarking on as South Africa and as Africa and even the world. So how fast or slow is the wheel of innovation turning in South Africa when it comes to alternative uh, building technologies? Okay, the, the, the one thing uh, which, which I, uh, in, in my previous slide I, I, I indicated there is around the social accepted, acceptability of products. So within the space of social infrastructure, there's very good, there's very good acceptance of innovative building technologies. So you look, you look into your clinics, your schools, et cetera, right? That's for social infrastructure. People are easy to accept that. If I tell you now and I said you go to go to a, a clinic, why, why, when you're in a clinic, you don't think about anything but to see uh, the nurse or the doctor, there, right? So you don't think about the building itself, right? So people don't have problems with the uptake of innovative technologies in the social infrastructure space, but in the human settlement space, because that's my biggest investment. So most of us, our biggest investment in our lifetime is in a house, right? So I'm not just going to quickly accept anything that is rubbish in, in quotation, right? Yeah. <laughs> Something that I perceive is not the same as a brick and mortar, and I'm putting all my life savings into that. So in the space of, of, of human settlements, it's a bit it's different from the space of, of social infrastructure. But we've yeah. seen that there's a gradual, there's gradual uptake of, of these technologies. But in, and, and, and look at McDonald's. Look at McDonald's, yeah, right? Yeah. All, are, are you aware that all McDonald's are innovative building technologies? Hmm? There's no McDonald's that is built from brick and mortar. Hmm? Right? But we don't know it. We just go to McDonald's and they have a McDonald's, a big Mac, yeah, there. True, true. Right? You understand? So in the space of social infrastructure, that's good. I mean, a, a, a next to where I stay, right? I, a, 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 I saw them building a shopping mall, right? And, the, and when I passed one day, two days later on, I saw McDonald's was up. <laughs> McDonald's was finished. Why? Quick to erect, and nobody's going to come and ask, hey, guys, in this McDonald's, what did you build it out of? But if I was to build the same McDonald's for, for your house, yeah. for your house, right, you start to have problems. Right? And yet, some of the McDonald's have been built since 1999 or early 2000. They've been there. And which, which McDonald's have you seen cracking or falling down? None. No, no, no. Yeah. So, and, and, and that brings me to the, 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 the next question, which came from Vusi. So Vusi was asking if South Africa is ready to actually embrace the non-traditional brick-like materials, especially multi-level buildings. It, it, multi-level buildings uh, and uh, uh, probably I can also give you an example that I've been involved in multi-level buildings, uh, uh, particularly your, your student accommodations, eh? your student accommodations and the savings that you actually get from multi-level construction using lightweight, lightweight materials, lightweight modular construction, right? you could save in the order of more than 25% of your total cost. right? And there's acceptability. Again, imagine a student. A student goes into a, into, into a room, is looking for accommodation, never interested in what, what is that building made of. Yeah. Right? Right? He, wants, he wants accommodation. That's it. Right? So, yeah. In more, and then I was also chatting this morning, actually, interesting. Right? And there's a project in Ekuruleni right? yeah. where they are actually building a three, four story buildings, a, a social, social houses, right? using another technology there. Right? So, and, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's a development of what was 3,500 houses, 3,500 houses that they're doing there. And it's all being built in innovative building technologies. So I think, especially once you start talking three, four stories right? <laughs> above, I think that the cost savings are significant. But whereas if you are going to talk of single story buildings, single story, I don't think that the savings is that much, unless if you're going to look at it from a life cycle costing point of view. What do I mean by life cycle costing? Look at the whole value chain and look into the future. Look at the, take into account your time to deliver, your time for construction. Then you might be able to say that the costs 
is lower than the conventional way of construction. But if you're just going to look at it uh, 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 from a construction cost perspective, you will find then that innovative construction and your uh, uh, brick and mortar construction, the cost for innovative might actually be higher than uh, the cost of the conventional way of construction. So yeah. you need to be able to either one, look at the whole life cycle cost, that's one thing, uh, and your energy efficiencies, energy savings in the long run, etc., which most people are not willing to look at. Right? That's one thing. But if you're going to go three, four stories or higher, then your cost savings become insignificant. Yeah. No, that, that, that is very clear. We, we have a hand up uh, from Mr. Mampeule. Um, Mr. Mampeule? Yes. Thanks, Lindo, and uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mahachi. I just want to add in on the question that Lindo you just asked now, just to say to some of the uh, the participants here that the tallest building in Africa, which is currently the Leonardo building, has actually been built out of ABT. So the tallest building that we see there in Santin and Leonardo, they've used ACC, which I think the doctor referred to earlier on. So those are the type of the things that an alternative building technology can do. I had an opportunity to speak to Bart, one of the developers there, and they've really done a good saving as per the doctor has mentioned. So in terms of acceptance is that people want to see things happening. If you say, I'm gonna build a house using ABT, that's great, just do it. And then people can come and join you and be able to maybe even buy that specific unit. So most of us uh, probably have been at the Leonardo building and we didn't even think that it was they use ABT. They've got a nice five-star restaurant there. People go there and they have um, nice meals. And that whole tallest building in the, in the whole of Africa has been done from an uh, ABT. Thanks, Lindo. Yeah, no, that's amazing. That's amazing because I, I'm, I'm actually thinking we, this is something that we, it, it can only be rolled out for affordable housing. Um, and when you start talking the big buildings, then it becomes a challenge. So are you saying to us, it can actually, the, the ABT as it is now, it can be rolled out on affordable housing and also on big projects like um, the tallest building in, in, in Africa? Yeah, I think let, let me also support that one. You see, you see, uh, uh, this, this is why uh, um, the uptake has been so slow in, in Africa of, of, of these technologies, because we want to focus on the low income bracket, right? Whereas there are many potentials in, in, in your upmarket uh, 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 property development. <laughs> So, when, so whether you are talking, you are talking of the Leonardo, or you are going to be talking of a, a, a big commercial, commercial uh, uh, shopping center, or so on, is, there are many, many opportunities in terms of you using innovative buildings. And some of them are actually a number of shopping malls are actually being built using innovative technologies. But probably there is not much of, um, of, of awareness that is actually happening that people don't know. Just the same way as I've mentioned McDonald's. And if you were to ask people McDonald's, nobody actually notices then that McDonald's is not being built of, yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's a beauty that we see every day. And yeah. But we don't realize what it's made of. Yeah, and, and, and just to come in there, I just want to find out as well, because as, as innovation happens, right? So there, there are a number of challenges because I, I believe that um, some of you right now, like the Rally and, and Mackenzie Mampeule Foundation, as, as, as well as Sahif, I believe they are doing the heavy lifting right now to prepare the future, to prepare South Africa for the alternative uh, building technologies as we know, uh, as we are going to know them in future. What are the biggest challenges um, in innovation uh, in relation to the barrier to entry right now? What are the challenges um, uh, yeah, what is, in yeah, terms of a barrier to entry? Yeah, yeah maybe this other might also be a, 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 a coming. But you see, the, big, the biggest problem that, that, that I have seen right, is this whole chicken and egg situation. Right? Where one, right, um, access to finance. Okay. So if, I, if I do have a, a technology, how do I establish a manufacturing plant? Right. So I go to a financial institution and want to get money from that financial institution. Right. But the financial institutions are not willing to provide that funds unless they see your order book. And your order book must clearly demonstrate that you do have a good, a, a, a clear orders in terms of a, a you being able to 
honor your financial obligation. Right? So they don't give you without an order. But who gives you the order book? <laughs> so if I go now to, to, to if, if it is, for example, human settlements, right? and I go to the provincial government, the national government, they don't give me the order book. Because they say, I want to see your manufacturing plant. I don't trust you. How can I give you an order of 10,000 houses right? when I don't see your manufacturing plant? And I've now made a commitment that I'm going to give you 10,000 units. Oh, yes. So, so they don't give me the order book. So now I, so, so now I end up in a situation where financial institutions cannot give me the finance. The, uh, the, uh, I, don't, I don't get the order book. Where do I end up? Right. And, 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 I, and I've seen them that in South Africa at the moment, there are very, very few manufacturing plants of innovative building technologies. Right. They were very well established. That I, I, on my fingertips, I don't think that there are more than five well established manufacturing plants that are fully, fully, fully functioning up and running. Yeah. Um, let me come in. The, um, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Mambele can come in for this one because I think it's in line with, um, with what Sahib is doing and what the Rally and Mark and Mambele Foundation are doing. Uh, in terms of affordable housing. And I want to understand for, maybe from him and you can come in Dr. Mahachi as well. What is the reason for the drive towards ABTs? Is it to, is, is there a housing crisis? Is there an accommodation crisis? What is actually the drive towards ABTs and why should we, why are we doing it now? Yes, thanks Lindo. I think currently um, we've seen during COVID-19 um, that um, uh, you know, we as Sahib donated about uh, 72 units that accommodated about 300 people within the space of two weeks. And, and that actually attracted a lot of people to look at ABT as, a, as, a, as an option to deliver housing uh, at, a, a, at that type of a speed. Now, obviously we did that using uh, what we call TRU, Temporary Residential Structure Units. But that was also sort of trying to show that there are options, which obviously with the alternative building technology, you it's not necessarily the most affordable one. Yes, you can have a good saving, especially if you are going high story, but in terms of speed, you definitely will definitely be able to get uh, a bit of uh, delivering housing quick. I mean, yes, Lindo, there's definitely a housing crisis in South Africa. I mean, the doctor mentioned that there's about 2.5 2, 2. million houses that still need to be built. And that, that tells you that there's about 6 million people that need to have a roof over their head. So, and we've tried for the last 25 years since with the new government to obviously see how many houses can be delivered. But I, I think the minister, the current minister of human settlement and the top management, they are of the view, and I must speak on their behalf, but they've indicated this in different conferences that, they, uh, that they, they're of the view that they, they must start looking at alternative building technology as a solution for affordable housing. And we're looking forward to that. But what we need to do is to implement. We need to implement, people need to take a risk and put investment and actually put these projects on the ground and let them go and let people come and look at it and put uh, and, 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 and buy the units. And you know, when they buy it, something that is ready, they'll get the confidence because they're seeing it. Then you're not telling them that you're going to be using an ABT. So I think there are a few, one or two alternative uh, technology building estates that are coming in the country and we're looking forward to see how that how far that can go. But it's definitely uh, a solution for the country. We think as as a, as one of the options. Yes, yes, yeah. Because and, and and I know you can't speak on behalf of you know what the government departments are doing in the background. But do you get a sense that uh, the government is 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 you know um, receiving this um, technology very well? Or how, how is government reacting to this? I think what has happened, Lindo, is that government tried to use an alternative building technology and it backfired. And I mean, we've seen this all over the newspaper. And that was sad news because there was inferior product that were, were not um, uh, used uh, properly. But there were other alternative building technologies that were used in the, in the, in the, in the, in the space of uh, TRU, the temporary residential units. And I think what has happened there is that um, based on that, there was a little bit of a, um, a, a, a confidence that was sort of dented a little bit. But 
I think government is, is still trying to proceed uh, with the alternative building technology, not necessarily only from the temporary residential units point of view, but also from actual building the actual unit. So there's big budgets where people are looking at actually using ABT to build affordable housing. And Lindo, you playing in the space of um, 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 uh, yeah. the big room dwellers where it's a big industry. And I've always say when I speak that it's a 10 billion dollar industry where people are renting rooms at the back of the yards uh, in the townships. And one of the things that I think people must look at is actually this, this ABT because you can also be able to build those units uh, and those rooms using ABT at a speed because they are also required at a very uh, at a, at a same speed that is needed uh, in terms of housing. So I think there's opportunities for that, and that's a big market. And I think ABT should be looked at in that in in that space as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think let, let me also add one thing which is very interesting, and from from what Rani is saying, you know, failures, right? The, 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 the unfortunate thing is that uh, um, when you get a failure on a technology, right, it doesn't necessarily mean then that uh, the technology doesn't perform well. Right? Uh, we need to be able to understand what has caused that failure. And, and, but what comes to the minds of many people is then that uh, innovation does not work. Right? How many bu buildings of brick and mortar are falling down? Can we conclude then that the brick and mortar does not work? It's not, it's not the case. We need to be able to understand that in context. But unfortunately, unfortunately, the recent failures that we've seen, both in the temporary residential units as well as in, in, in some of the other residential uh, markets, is, is tainting the image, right? which is not the case. Yeah. Um Thanks for that. Um, so we have a question, one last question um, from, from, from uh, Denzel. So he says they, they, they build houses using the alternative te uh, building technology, right? So the technology that they use is already AGRIMA approved, but the certification is under their technology supplier. So he wants to, he wants to apply for their own AGRIMA certification. And he just wanted to find out if the application, the new application will be simplified, taking into account that the technology that they, they use has already undergone AGRIMA certification before. Okay, uh, it's, it's, it, I, I, again, I would have loved to, 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 to go through that. And I, I hope you can give the person my, uh, my, uh, what do you call, my contact numbers, because my next few slides we're going to talk about that, eh? <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, there's a thing which is also called licensee, right? A licensee of, of, of Agroma. You still need to be able to, to apply to Agroma and Agroma can give you as a licensee uh, of, of a particular system. But that, obviously, it will be an agreement first between you and the license holder, right? So uh, uh, the licensee and the license holder, they, they will then make an application to Agroma. And if that is the case, it's probably a one day exercise to get through that. So it's, it's a question really of payment and if payment is done, uh, you can get your license uh, uh, with, within, within a day, right? But you must make, bear in mind then that the one who is accountable for that system is still the license holder, right? And the license holder must monitor the implementation of his or her system on the ground. So it still, still takes accountability of that particular system. But however, if you are if, if you are not talking of a licensee and you are simply saying, I want to have my own system, right? But my own system is the, is similar to Raleigh's system, right? In, in that case, because Agroma does not get involved in, um, uh, uh, in IP, right? So even if you bring through to us a system which looks like Raleigh's system, right? We'll go through the process. I don't go through the process as if they are actually starting afresh or not. Right? Although in the back of their minds, they would know them that we have tested this before. So there are certain things we can quickly skip through that particular process. Right? But in, in terms of transparency and everything else, they can actually issue you with your own license. Right? But you will find with your license holder because you are trying to copy some, someone else. So, as a license holder, you need to do your own IP protection, make sure that you register this uh, IP of yours 
uh, so that other people don't copy your IP. But it's not the responsibility of Agro. Right. So the person that is asked the question, if, if that person wants to become a licensee, if they can contact me and I can give them more information or the, uh, the relevant person to do so. It's not a difficult process. It will just be a question of filling out certain forms and we are done. No, thank you very much. I think that clarifies that, that clarifies the question, and um, you've given us enough information. I think some 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 of the guys that need some of the information you were sharing today, I will arrange with uh, Juiko to share some of the information. The one that is con confidential will obviously not be shared with everyone, and the contact details will also be shared with um, the, the 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 specific person that asked this question. But this um, basically brings us to um, almost the end of the discussion. Um, I see Mr. Juiko is waiting patiently to ensure that we we are in time and online. Do you are, are you happy with how the discussion has gone, Mr. Juiko? Yes, I am. Thank you so much, I mean, you Dr. Yes. Mahachi. So, so, um, really Oh. Just, before, just before you go, sorry, okay. Doctor. Yeah, I'm just saying. Just before you go, uh, uh, I just wanted maybe let me just take two seconds or so to just highlight it that uh, I know I did not finish two or three slides. Uh, uh -huh. That yeah, that is that that is the website. It's it's on the screen there, and and the presentation I've emailed it to uh, uh, to Zico. It's, it, it, you can share it with with anybody, so there's no confidentiality in that presentation. So the details of of, of Agroma are given on, on the website, and uh, I've also given the how the certificate looks like, the details, and this was the, addressing the, the person who was asking about licensee. These are the details of, of what 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 actually happens, and uh, the, when you are looking at a certificate, what critical information should you be looking for? Right. On, a, on a typical certificate, this is how it would look like. As I said, remember it's a book, but make sure the information indicated here is actually available. Then. You must also remember then that Agroma is not about building systems only. Right? It covers anything that is innovative in the construction industry, which means that that can include your transportation, your portholes, your bridge decks, your roof tiles, whatever it is, under membranes, it, it, it's not only building systems, anything construction right, that is innovative. Right? So that so that is all that is here. I think that those were the two slides that was actually remaining uh, for me to just complete. It. But you can share the information with the rest of the world. Thanks. Th th thanks Thank so you much. very much, Dr. Mahachi. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Um, I know as well that you had a meeting right at 4.30. So thank you for going over time with us. Um, it's a really important subject. And I think as well, it, it shows the level of interest that there is now. Um, Rally, uh, thank you so much for joining yourself. I think also the, the information you provided around, I didn't know that the Leonardo had been built with ABT as well, because I think those are the things that need to be highlighted, especially because it's not a new thing. I think it's been going on, but we always think of it in a low income setting. Um, and there's such opportunity and such use of it in high income settings. And if we talked about that more, probably the level of acceptance would, would increase significantly. But I just would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahachi once again for your time. Lindo, thank you for being our MC. Uh, to each and every one of you that have joined us today, thank you very much for, for taking the time. As I said at the beginning, right at the top of um, when we started, the reason that we have the masterclass is Mr. Rali Mampeole, he wants to help and work with a lot of people. However, he has limited time as we all do. And so working one-on-one -on -one with each and every one of you is not always possible. So we have this series of masterclasses which connects you to industry experts such as Dr. Mahachi, uh, who are able to share their knowledge for you to be able to participate in the property sector. So we encourage you to share our events in the future and also participate. As I've said as well, we're going to be putting uh, this video on uh, YouTube for anyone who wasn't able to join, they would also be able to, to, to gain something from this. We will share um, the information by email as well as Dr. Mahachi has allowed us to. So I thank you very much, everybody. Please have a great day and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thanks a lot, guys. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, for your presence and time. Appreciate it.